Okay, uh, I think we should get started. So, okay. Clinton, if you could start the recording, and then Bernard, I'll hand over to you to start us off properly. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks, Nick. Hello, I'm Bernard Hyde, CEO at SUMS, and today I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, the first in a series of focused online events designed to help you move forward the online learning agenda such that it delivers a high quality experience that will enable your students to succeed. As a sector, we've had to respond rapidly to the challenges that COVID-19 presented. An immediate tactical response was the move to online learning across the board with varying degrees of success given student feedback. As we move out of the phase of immediate need, now is the time for universities to take the opportunity to turn this into a long-term strategic move. Using the crisis and our learnings as a spur to do things differently and explore new opportunities. To help understand better the strategic opportunities presented and the challenges and the issues, we've partnered with BISC, who were pioneers in this area with more than 20 years experience and who partner with many leading US universities to deliver insights and practical case studies from the US. Today we're pleased to we welcome Professor Keith Niblett from Michigan State University, Dr. Telia DeBerry, and Dr. Jennifer King from BISC Education. Over to you guys. So good morning, I'm Dr. Jennifer King. Please call me Jen today, um, especially as you're asking questions um, in our chat window. Uh, we're so happy to be with you. I am the Academic Program Director for BISC, as uh, Bernard mentioned. Um, and if you could move to the next slide, I want to just tell you a little, really briefly, a little bit about BISC. We probably are one of the oldest um, online program management companies in the United States. We have a 50-year tradition of working with um, U.S. partners, colleges and universities, moving them online. And literally that started in 1971 by our very first um, CEO and owner, Nathan Bisk. And since 1971, we've touched so many schools. We've developed over 300 uh, certificate programs, 200 degree programs. Um, one of our oldest longstanding university partners is Michigan State University. And um, that is why I've asked uh, Professor Keith Niblett to join us today to give us some of his insights. I, um, Keith, can you uh, share a little bit about MSU for us today? Of course I can. Thank you, Jen. Uh, it's Keith Besant Niblett. I've actually been in the United States since 2002. Um, I moved from Cranfield to Thunderbird in Arizona, and I've now been at Michigan State after Thunderbird for 14 years. Uh, Michigan State was the very first land-grant institution. It was actually given to us uh, by um, Mr. Lincoln. Um, and uh, that means that we're very proud to be the first of the Big Ten universities, the state universities, uh, that are actually basically in what is the Midwest in America, which is not really Midwest at all. It's more like sort of slightly East. Um, we have grown um, as a result of that because the land grant literally gave us about seven miles one way by four miles another. Uh, and that's probably 10 kilometers by six kilometers. And that means that we started off as an agricultural institution because that was exactly what uh, we had uh, at that time in Michigan. It was just farmland really. Um, and engineering came along in the 1890s. The business college of which I'm a part came along in the 1920s. You can see on your screen, we've now got 17 full-blown colleges, which means that they are PhD loaded. Uh, we have 62 schools, which enables us to teach undergrads and masters. Uh, we have over 200 degree programs. And I don't think we'll get 50,000 students on campus at the end of August, but uh, uh, approximately a third are actually coming to campus. Um, therefore, uh, in uh, late August, we're going to do the tripartite of uh, teaching online, blended learning 
and also in classroom. Um, and it's going to be an interesting experiment. It's the first time we've really done it thoroughly for one whole semester. Yes, and the, and the BISC and MSU partnership is through the um, Broad School of Business, the executive education uh, program. We have three programs, three degree programs with Michigan State and a certificate program. And that's where Keith and I work very closely together. Um, we're gonna talk more with Keith as we move on through this webinar, but um, we're gonna move on into what we're calling the steps to bringing courses online. And at this stage, uh, Tilly and I, Dr. DeBerry and I, we're going to kind of walk through what we call the five steps to bringing courses online. Uh, please feel free as we're going through our presentation to add questions in the chat. Nick is going to kind of monitor that for us and make sure that we can address those questions at the end of our presentation. We're going to wrap it up at the very end with some Q&A with, with Dr. Niblett because we want to get his perspective also on what it was like to transition from on-ground to online. So let me start with the first step in on, online course planning. And step one is really to determine your course outcomes and objectives. And as you know, this is important on ground as well as online. We need to do this, whether we're face-to-face -face with our students in a classroom or whether we're building course content in a learning management system. I came up with this chair um, analogy for BISC because I'm trying to, you know, obviously educate those professors that come to partner with us to build online courses. And I like to think of step one as this chair. It starts with, of course, your course outcomes, which is the, that back of the chair, and it proceeds into the seat, right, with, with module or weekly objectives. And if you think about the components of an online course, I call it AAA alignment at BISC, which is when you start with your course outcomes, you move to weekly or module um, learning objectives, you have this AAA alignment, right? It's your, after that, you have your assignments, your activities and assessments that follow um, those first two components. Everything needs to be aligned, right? So if you think about a chair, you can live without the back of a chair, you can live without the seat of a chair, if you, or you can live without the legs of a chair, right? If you take a leg from the chair, it could be wobbly, but you can still sit on it. You can take the arms from the chair. It might be uncomfortable, but you can still sit on it. But, and you can live without the back of the chair if you think about it. But the one thing you cannot live without on a chair is what? The seat. A chair begins with the seat, right? So those weekly module objectives for an online course are your anchors for success. Without your weekly objectives, without those modular objectives, communicated not just in the syllabus to your online students but also really um, elevated and pro pro profoundly placed in your online course you really have nothing to sit on okay you have to actually make sure that you're not assuming that students already know what you're doing weekly you need to make sure that's really spelled out for your online student which takes us to step number two Step number two, once we have that determined, we then have to really gather and organize our, our instructional content. And Telia um, is going to talk a little bit about what that looks like. How do we go from the, the course outcomes, weekly objectives, to gathering or, and organizing your content? Sure. Um, my camera went off. I apologize for that. Um, the first thing you want to ask yourself is what sort of activities am I going to include in my course? What sort of assessments would I like to include in my course? Um, so a lot of faculty members that we have worked with in the past, and I myself was a faculty member who struggled to put courses online um, because before I worked um, at BISC, of course. Um, and oftentimes faculty members will um, use the online classroom as a sort of repository for PowerPoints and worksheets and maybe even just the grade book. But thinking about the course as a learning experience and thinking about the ways that you can um, align your course objectives with the content and bring the course content itself to life. So some of the things that we recommend faculty members do um, when they are moving a course online rapidly is to leverage YouTube, TED Talks, that sort of thing. 
but also um, don't discount a voice over PowerPoint. So um, recording your, your lectures, if you use something like PowerPoint or Keynote, recording your voice over that and including that within the course content. So um, if you wanna move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Once you have figured out what sort of activities you would like in your course and what you think that your students need to be able to get a better understanding of the course content, you have to think about the learning management system that you are using to deliver your online course. Um, some of the things that, um, that we leverage when we are working with faculty members to bring the course content online is the first and foremost is a content page. And a lot of people, a lot of faculty members, oh, I'm sorry, a lot of professors um, definitely want um, to use video and the PowerPoint and all of that but don't discount a content page. So a lot of the times, if I have some content that I would like to deliver and I wanna show some links to different things, we will, um, I will write a, like, kind of like a blog page or like a mini web page, mm -hmm. and I will include the links, the graphics, and all of that on those content pages. When it comes to including videos, Jen does the best job of explaining purposeful media, so I'm gonna let her go ahead and do that. Yeah, purposeful media is, is key, is the key word, purposeful, because I think in the, when you move, when you transition from on ground to online, the first thing we think of as professors is, okay, if I lecture, typically if I'm in, a, in, in class on ground with my students face to face and I'm lecturing, let's say 30, 40, even 50 minutes and my students are taking notes, this is the way I flow, this is the way I work as a professor, how in the world do I do that online? And so the assumption is that, okay, if I teach for, or if I lecture for 50 minutes, I need to have a 50 minute video lecture in my online course. And I will tell you right now that the, the student of the 21st century, especially our, our millennials, are not watching 50 minute videos. They just are not doing it. They're used to social media blasts, they're sh used to short snippets of video. They are not looking for one hour lectures. They are looking for two types of purposeful video. The first purposeful video type is the challenging concept. So where Cleary was talking about content pages, you think of the textbooks that you're using in your courses. You think of the things that you're trying to convey to your students in instruction. You think of the challenging concept, the video, the two minute video that's going to help with that challenging concept that is not going to be addressed on content pages that will not be addressed in the textbook. That's purposeful video number one. The other purposeful video is what I call the anecdotal evidence. That's something that only you can convey in a video. It's from your personal experience. It's you talking about an experience or an event or a real world situation that only you can bring to bear in a video to your students. And so I just wanna drive that home, that purposeful video um, everything does not have to be video. It should be two minutes or less typically with our millennials. And then videos can lead to great discussions with your students. And Telia has a great professional development course that she provides through this called Discussion Boards and how to use Discussion Boards. Telia, talk a little bit about the Discussion Board aspect of courses. Okay, um, discussions are really sort of the hub of the online course, and um, it's one of the places where you can not only display your subject matter expertise, you can guide your students, but you also create that sort of social aspect within the course. So discussions are, are, are super important um, for having the students sort of dig through the content and find meaning. So um, ensuring that your discussions are aligned to your weekly objectives is, is essential. And writing discussion boards that allow students to um, bring real world examples, maybe examples from if, they, if they're a student who works, bringing examples from their job or from their home life or something like that, but getting them to be able to apply the concepts. That's one of the, the important things about discussions. So, um, also on this slide, we have assignments and interactions. Um, assignments, it depends on the particular LMS, the learning management system that you're using to deliver your course, but um, typical assignments are, you know, paper submissions and, and even quizzes, that sort of thing. Um, interactions, um, there is one tool that, um, 
that we use when we are developing courses and um, you can get a free version of it. It's called H5P. So if you wanted to create some sort of interaction and you're comfortable um, in, in uh, working with the code within your LMS, um, that's definitely a tool that we use for interactions that we have found to be very easy to use and actually very engaging. So mm -hmm. next slide. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to sort of go through is um, again that um, I, I mentioned earlier about how um, a lot of the professors that we've worked with in the past and including myself used the learning management system as more of like a repository for PowerPoint presentations and documents. Um, I wanted to show in, in our LMS Canvas what we have created um, as a best practice for a, a typical learning um, module. So in Canvas, you might be in a different LMS, and they're all very similar, and they all have similar um, functionalities when it comes to organizing the course. Um, we always break up things into modules or weeks. So modules being a thematic content area, or weeks being um, just a way to keep the students knowing what what week we're on and where, where we're sequenced and where we're going. Um, I say for undergraduates, weeks works very well and keeps them on track. Graduates more, more like a, um, a thematic week might be better. Um, so those are the modules. We usually title those so the students kind of know where they're at. Um, we have content pages. A couple of the content pages in this particular module is, this is a module one, so we have not only a course introduction, but we have an introduction to module one. So in module two, you'd have the introduction to module two. In the introductions, we're just guiding the students through the content. This is what we're going to learn this week. These are your objectives for this week. That way the students know what they're supposed to be focusing on. Content pages are not only just introductions, but also areas where we deliver content that we don't necessarily have media for. So again, if I, I sometimes will write a, a short blog art, I consider them blog articles, um, where I explain the content. And I might use some graphics that I find on the internet or pictures that explain what I'm um, talking about. So those are content pages. And then you have the discussions and assignments. And oftentimes you'll find that um, some professors prefer to put all the discussions and assignments at the end. I like to put them in exactly where they're meant to be with the content. That way the students go from, from learning the content directly to assessing themselves. So um, we have, first we have an introduce yourself discussion. That's a great first thing to give to the students so that they get to know each other a little bit and get to know you. Um, and then we have the discussions that are sort of peppered throughout this module. And so you'll notice that um, you have discovering uh, your preferred instructional model assignment is right under the instructional models area. So this is kind of how we would set up a uh, course. And you could have, um, depending on your LMS and the settings, you can have graded and ungraded assignments. Um, and that's a great way to allow your students to self-reflect. So next slide. Now step five um, of, going, go, uh, of bringing your course online is something that oftentimes um, professors um, will kind of skip. Um, going live is just bringing your course online and making sure you're facilitating it. Um, but getting feedback is super important. Um, there's a couple different ways you could do that. You can um, provide them with an open discussion board. Um, where did they find challenges? What, what did they need more information about? You can have that. Um, some students are shy about sharing that sort of thing. So you could, depending on your LMS, uh, create a poll. Um, in the LMSs, you can often, especially in Canvas, if you're in that, um, you can create an anonymous poll. So you can do that as well. So that way your students feel comfortable giving you feedback about the course. You can also do that with SurveyMonkey and sharing a, a SurveyMonkey link or another survey tool if you'd like. Mm -hmm. So, um, but getting that feedback so that um, next time you run the course, you're able to make the improvements that you need. Understand that bringing a course online is an iterative process. There's no instructional material that will ever be perfect. Um, you'll always want to be improving that. Yeah, and the final slide that we have in our presentation is just the big picture expectations between developing an undergraduate online course and a postgraduate online course. And in my experience, undergraduate students and postgrads are actually very similar in terms of their expectations. Both groups 
want clarity, they want clear expectations, they want organization in the course through the learning management system. They definitely want instructor presence, they want to be interacting with their professor as well as their peers. So their expectations are the same, it's just their motivations are different, right? So the undergraduate student who might be moving online, um, they're still wanting to have that campus life experience. So my recommendation to you is, if your institution is really moving undergrad fully online because of the virus, you still need to make sure that you have opportunities for them to feel like they're part of the larger campus, part of campus life, um, maybe having online office hours available so that they can still interact with you as the professor. Finding, using an announcements tool, for instance, to tell them what is going on on campus or what things they can be involved with that are, of course, social distance and those types of things. Um, that's the undergraduate wanting to be a part of the bigger campus experience, whereas your postgraduate not so much interested in the, the big campus experience, but they're looking for how can this course accelerate them professionally. So they want that instructor connection, but they're looking for networking, right? They're looking for opportunities to grow professionally with their professor. And in those courses, I would encourage you to um, use project-based learning strategies, scenario-based learning strategies for graduates, giving them real-world examples in the course to get them to grow professionally. And so that's really the, the, the motivation is different. The expectations are the same, but your motivations are different and therefore your course design is, is gonna be tweaked to meet their needs. And so we're really coming up at like a, maybe nine, uh, like a quarter till the end of our session. And I wanna give Dr. Um, Keith Niblett an opportunity to kind of a talk about some of his experiences moving online. Um, Keith and I have been working together for a couple of years, BISC and MSU working in concert to move some of his, or to, to develop his certificate programs and move those online in Canvas. And um, what I did, Keith and I were thinking of kind of what are the big buckets, we call these challenges that you typically will face. If you're moving from on ground to online, what are sort of the big bucket challenges that any professor will face moving online? Keith has been, has been an on-ground professor for many years and then moved online. So those big buckets, and we might not be able to address them all in this session, but instructor challenges would be number one, content challenges would be two, student challenges would be three, and technology challenges would be number four. My first question for Keith would be that, Keith, when you moved from on ground to online, did you have to reinvent yourself and your, you know, the way you instruct when you ha when you moved online? Did you have to change? Yes, and of course, you know, I did it quite early. As soon as I got to Thunderbird, then I discovered that we had a joint MBA program with Latin America. And uh, those were in the days when you actually had classes and studios, and you were talking to a television screen which showed 40 faces in uh, Tech de Monterey and another 40 faces that were sitting in front of you in the classroom. That's what I've learned you must never do. Um, because in the end, you don't know what style you're actually gonna be teaching in. Are you teaching to the 40 that are actually in front of you or the 40 that are on the big TV screen? Mm -hmm. um, so th that type of learning is very, very difficult to master. Yeah. Uh, the, the second thing about the instructor challenge is how do you get student preparedness? Yeah. And, uh, you've mentioned some of those things already, uh, but I know now, which I didn't know then, because, you know, as a faculty member, I used to walk in the classroom with a bunch of slides or even foils and, yeah. and actually just engage them in conversations around the slides. You really can't do that online. Right. So, yeah, exactly. It, it does mean that uh, they have to be incredibly pre-prepared. Mm -hmm. So I do much prefer that they have been into self-paced learning sessions so that they are prepared for a discursive situation. Okay. Um, if we haven't got that, then I'll actually post material and, and then insist that they read it before we have a chat. And then it's the polling, then it's the group discussions and all of those things that are available on Zoom. Um, but uh, what we've learned, and I think you've taught me this to a degree, Jen, 
that if I talk for more than seven minutes, everybody gets lost. Yes. So, you know, it has to be concise, it has to be precise, and you have to find some way of, of gaining uh, student engagement. That's so true, because one of the things that makes Keith in particular an amazing instructor is his, his um, anecdotal stories, the things he's experienced. He's such a rich lecturer that um, you can't assume that students are going to still enjoy that lecture in a video, right? you know that on ground they could listen to you for hours they would sit there and take notes and notes and notes face to face but we cannot assume that you're going to be able to give them that same experience just through a video right yep. that's one of the assumptions we make i think the other assumption that you alluded to keith was we we have to make sure that the course is prepared in the learning management system we can't assume that we're going to show up into a classroom and be able to reset expectations there is no classroom if you don't, haven't set expectations in the learning management system, you're not going to have not another opportunity to do so. And that comes to the content part. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I've moved through the theater style into the talking heads pre-prepared style. And now we're in the four dimensional style. Yeah. And uh, what we are moving into in terms of content is everything really is probably read on, on the cell phone or the mobile phone, as they say in England. So true. Um, and uh, that means that everything that you design in advance, which is going to be self-paced learning again, has got, you've got to think of the mini tablet. You've got to think of the cell phone. And you've also got to think of ways in which they can listen to the recordings of the text of the content. Mm. So we have moved, in terms of content, um, completely away from talking heads. We don't do that anymore. We don't really do slides anymore either, but everything becomes something that is very easy to scroll down or across mm -hmm. on a cell phone. And it's remarkable, I teach internationally and uh, often um, my friends in the Middle East and India, the only connectivity they can find is on the cell phone. So you have to think that way. That is so true. Tell us too, Keith, your experience with say learning management system. So you're mainly using Canvas right now. And yes. then also your experience with Zoom and teaching remotely. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, Zoom is difficult in as much that you, uh, as, as probably it's being displayed right now in front of all the many people that are watching this, uh, you don't see all the faces unless you scroll it up and down. And you do want to see the faces if you're doing live sessions on Zoom. Now, I tend not to use overlays. I tend not to use anything more than saying, you've already seen this, you've already learned this, let's talk around the model or whatever. Uh, but nonetheless, it's difficult to actually see more than about 20 people uh, in, on Zoom. And, you know, I can scroll up and down now and see who's on. Most people have switched uh, their, their, their actual um, picture off. So all I'm seeing is names. And uh, that's what students do. They all switch off the videos. Um, Nick Skelton has just turned on his video. Um, but it's remarkable if the students forget to turn off the video, what they're actually doing while you're trying to discuss things with them. Uh, so Zoom is difficult in that regard. There's much more control, obviously, in a face-to-face -face classroom. Definitely. So Nick, we're gonna to toss it over to you. I know we have about 15 minutes left and I know you wanna address some of our Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Telia, and thank you, Keith. Okay. Um, that's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some very important points. Um, two takeaway messages for me on this are that preparation really is important. And when you're delivering teaching online, you can't wing it. Uh, you do need to have put in your preparation in advance. Uh, but equally, you don't need to aim for perfection. Uh, preparation is important, but your learning materials will never be perfect. There'll be an ongoing uh, process of improvement. Uh, and I think that's quite reassuring for all of us. I'll go back to some of the questions that were asked in advance and some of the questions we've had in through the discussion today. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions in the text chat and commentary about assessment. Uh, formative and summative assessment. So there's a question to Telia from Mike Wald. Which of the discussions and assignments are optional, formative, ungraded? 
and which are compulsory summative graded. Could you say a little bit about the balance of those in a online learning situation? Sure. I think it, I think it honestly it depends on the content. I know that that sounds like a fake answer, but <laughs> it depends on, um, on the content. Now we always have uh, introductory discussions or ungraded. Um, any sort of Q&A or resource discussions are always ungraded. Um, but if there are certain concepts that, um, that you are really, like if you have an objective that you're really trying to meet with a specific discussion board, I would make that graded because I, I, the students you'll find that um, unless it's an introductory discussion board, um, they won't necessarily participate unless they have to um, if it's not graded. So that's one kind of pitfall of the discussion boards area. Jen, do you have any additional insight on that, your thoughts? Just that with your learning management system, you, you, don't, you can set up your LMS to have ungraded and graded. Yeah. That the technology will do that for you. <clears throat> to determine in your content where where that ungraded assessment or graded assessment fits within the context of your content and let the learning management set that up for you that the learning management system set that up for you it's super okay. easy right Keith yes Jen and uh, also within that you can have a pass fail mechanism that was the point yeah you know we often set 70 percent in multiple choice questions um, which enables therefore uh, whoever is monitoring that uh, to actually focus on the failures, if you like, and, and find out which people have got the multiple choices wrong and what are the questions. The other interesting thing about multiple choice questions is you can see trends. Uh, frequently in multiple choice questions, you'll get one question that everybody gets wrong. Right. Um, and uh, so that's a good learning for the professor because it must be covered down the line. That's right. And so, uh, again, uh, it's really amazing how much of the mechanisms and the stats you can actually get from this grading mechanism. Yeah. Uh, another question, this was possibly rhetorical, but I think it touches on quite an important point. Uh, what percentage of students actually do optional activities that do not contribute to the overall mark? And I think the reason that's interesting is possibly something that many people worry when they're moving online is how do we ensure students actually complete the activities that they need to do? We're not standing over them, watching them in a room. Um, so how do we ensure when we're working online that students do put the work in and complete what might not be seen as compulsory? I think it's the beginning of the course, Nick. At the, at, the, at the start of the course, you have to really set those expectations up front. And that, that is achieved really through instructor presence, professor presence. If that professor builds an, a learning environment, a learning ecosystem in that learning management system where they are ever present and everything has meaning and value and they explain the meaning and value of every opportunity that they bring forth in that course, whether it's graded or ungraded, those students will will complete those exercises, but it really is dependent on instructor presence and the buy-in that the instructor gets by building that that ecosystem of learning. Like we're all in this together, we're all going to learn together uh, mentality. And if if you don't contribute, then we all lose out if you're not contributing to um, these exercises. And so again, it goes down to preparation, like you said before, Nick. But that, that professor, it's on the professor to build that environment where everything is meaningful and it matters. A great deal of what I do is feedback sessions. And uh, it, it, you could actually see um, by the feedback if they've done the work or not, to be honest. Yes, that's um, okay. <laughs> it depends upon the size of the group. Uh, if it's 20, um, then I'll pick a random 10. Um, if it's 30, then I'll bunch them into groups of five. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that way, you can soon see if they've actually thought through the little problem that you've set and uh, whether they've actually come up with some unique ideas. Keith, you've just touched on what was going to be my next question. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's, that's great. Um, so I've got a question here from someone who's asking, how do we get students who may be scattered around the world to do group work? 
So this is what's really been stumping him when trying to move from uh, in-person to online teaching. How do you get students to do group work in an online environment? Well, th there is a function um, on Zoom that enables you to do that. Um, uh, what I tend to do is to actually get people to self-select their teams. Mm -hmm. um, that creates cohesiveness. It overcomes the forming and storming stage and gets them straight into norming. Um, around the world, um, yes, certain nations like to bunch together. And to be honest, I tend to let that happen um, because you get a lot more feedback from people that feel comfortable with each other. So I do that as well. Connectivity around the world these days, as long as they got a cell phone, isn't too bad. Um, and, and it does tend to work. And particularly in the Indian environment, you'll see the cell phone propped up with two or three people in the same room. Um, and, and that's quite interesting because it's a cell phone culture. Thanks, Keith. Great question that Neil Dixon has just asked. How do you integrate independent learning activities like study skills and library support to help sort of widen the base of resources and develop skills. Celia, I think that's a good one for you because that has to do with the organization of the LMS and where you would put some of those supplemental pieces um, in a course. Sure. Um, one of the things that we like to do is create a, uh, like a getting started area um, within the course. Um, sometimes we call it a week zero. Sometimes it's called getting started. I think getting started sounds nicer. Um, and we, cr we actually put in um, like housekeeping items, but we also create specific pages that are dedicated to things like exploring the library. So if we have tutorials or if there's anything from the library, um, we have libguides um, that uh, will provide like research uh, databases for specific subject areas and all of that. We integrate that into the getting started area. And in, uh, if you like, uh, self-paced learning, which is pre-prepared and they read it in advance, then often you can actually just put a little tile in there, which will take you off to somewhere else. Um, so uh, I do a lot of that within the self-paced learning in as much as probably every half a page, if you like to call it that, uh, will have a mechanism for zooming off somewhere else. So in the self-paced style, they can actually start to investigate for themselves. I'll just chip in myself on this a little. In my own work, talking with people across the sector since the COVID-19 crisis hit, I've realised that those study skills advisors are some of the absolute unsung heroes yes. who really <laughs> help students succeed. Yes. Um, and we will be touching on this later in our series of events and later in the month. We've got one which we've entitled something like uh, Ensuring Student Success, uh, where we'll go into that and look at how you ensure progression from year to year and success in the online or blended environment. Um, and I think maybe the last question that I've already got, unless there's any more that come in in the final five minutes, but this is quite a big one, which came in from Peter Tinson. Um, can institutions move quickly to a sort of blended online and in-person um, way of working? Or would they actually be more successful if they took this slowly piloted things, did it in stages? Well, we had to. Um, basically we were in lockdown um, I remember coming back from India where I was teaching um, on April the 11th and we were locked down on April the 16th and I had a class right through to the summer um, and that was basically a face-to-face -face class and uh, I had to turn that almost overnight into an, an online course now of course you need people around you like Tia and Jen to actually help you through that. Uh, but uh, yes, we, we did it very swiftly uh, because we were literally running online courses um, by April the 23rd. So within a week, we'd started it. Um, is the quality as good? Of course it's not. Um, uh, but if you base it upon what you are already planning to do in the class, it would do for now. Now, because of what I explained right at the start, uh, then we know that we're going to have a third blended, a third online and a third in the classroom roughly. 
So we've had to prepare all three elements at the same time. That's what a lot of us have been doing all summer, uh, is to actually take the material we were planning to teach in the fall and turning it into the other two mechanisms. Um, can you do it fast and well? You can do it fast and then you think about how you can make it 20% better. And that's where the pre-design really comes in. That's so true. And just to add to that too, Nick, um, on the BIS side, our best practices, uh, we've developed a consultation model um, that's been pretty successful, especially through the summer, where we're helping institutions roll out online courses very swiftly. We call it accelerated development. And you know, if you have a if you have 200 courses in your portfolio, you don't need all 200 to launch in fall. They sort of spread out throughout the, the school year, correct? Yes. So we have an 18 month strategic rollout that we an 18 month plan of strategic rollout of either blended, hybrid, or online. Um, and that delivery model has been going very well in terms of helping schools move quickly and with quality in mind, um, moving online. So it can be done. And like I said, we do, we're implementing that accelerated model just for that purpose of how do we ensure quality while we're moving quickly to put things online. And could I just say um, that the faculty at Michigan State have been amazing in being able to convert to this. We were expecting quite a high casualty rate of faculty that are saying, there's no way, Jose, I'm going to do online. Uh, but, you know, you can talk probably on one hand, the faculty that couldn't make the transition. That's true. But everybody, when they had to, actually did it pretty well. And we've had feedback now from students for the spring term and summer term. And, and the, the feedback has been pretty good. Uh, the worrying thing is, are we ever going to go back to full face-to-face? Um, and I think that remains to be seen, uh, but particularly at undergrad level, they actually love everything online. Yes, they do. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting how much of this becomes a transformation very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you to all our speakers. We had one or two questions that came in that were a little bit more specific. Uh, Belinda was interested in Microsoft Teams and Farway was interested in HTML homepage in Canvas. If you'd like to stay on the call at the very end when most of the participants leave, uh, maybe we'll run through those for you on an individual basis uh, rather than keeping everyone in. But uh, Clinton, if you just advance to the next final slide, uh, I'd just like to mention the next events in the series coming up. Um, so we've got one on Wednesday next week, the 5th of August, around different techniques you can use to engage and involve students. Um, and then the one I mentioned on student success and ensuring they achieve their full potential. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the month, we'll be looking at the sort of long term opportunities for universities and how we can use the COVID-19 crisis as a, a springboard to do things differently and not just as an emergency response. Um, thank you to everyone today for attending. Um, we'll send you a recording of this after the session. Uh, if you've got more questions we haven't got to, please do send them back by email and we'll attempt to incorporate those into the future sessions. Um, and there are one or two people I mentioned if you want to stay on at the very end, and I've got a few short words of advice for you or some of our speakers might. Other than that, thank you so much for coming and I hope you found today uh, useful, interesting and enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you all. I find Teams so clunky, I much prefer Zoom, if uh, th there's a response to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't think that Bill Gates will let Zoom stay ahead for long. So I um, think Teams will get better and better and better. For those interested in Teams, I'll mention another online learning community, uh, which is called the DigiLearn community, um, which is run out of UC LAN here in the UK. Um, if you search for the DigiLearn community, um, you should be able to find it. If you can't, um, I can send you a URL for it, Belinda. And there's real expertise in using Teams in, in that. That's platform. one word, is it, Nick? DigiLearn? DigiLearn. There's several different DigiLearns, if you Google it, is the slight problem.
Um, but um, I can dig I can dig out the exact URL for Blinda or anyone else interested. Uh, the HTML homepage in Canvas. Um, I don't know if Keith, if you can touch on that as a Canvas user. Uh, I can probably speak to that. Uh, this is a Jen or Atelia question, really. It's okay. It's a design question. Yeah. So uh, we, we do use, um, in, our, in our courses, we do have uh, what we consider to be a home page. We do, what I prefer to do is to use the syllabus as the home page, and then I customize the top of the syllabus page with um, typically a banner image. Um, sometimes we will link that banner image, we'll create buttons and um, with the HTML and we'll link to specific areas of the course as a way to drive the students to the module page. Um, in the past, we've had weekly buttons. Um, I'm not sure if the students use that. I prefer to have a getting started button as per like quality matters standards and, and things like that. Um, and then like a tech support button and then a modules button that will take them directly to uh, the content areas. So, but we have done that quite a bit. I like to have the syllabus page specifically for Canvas as part of that landing page because the students can go directly to the assignments and they see the dates and um, for the assignments and they can link right to that. And discussion boards as well. They'll often short circuit and go straight to discussions which mm -hmm. I, I think is quite interesting because that's on the left-hand master page. I use it a lot as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, I think we will leave things there. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I'd always rather leave you wanting slightly more, given that we have got further events coming up in the series. Uh, so if you go to the SUMS website, www.sums.org.uk, and book onto those if you haven't already, uh, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.